And we'll go for about an hour here. Um, and we've got uh, three presenters this morning. Uh, I'm Morris York. I'm from the University of Michigan. I am Associate University Librarian for IT uh, at the University of Michigan. And we've got uh, Ariana and David, if you'd introduce yourselves. I'm David Lewis. I'm the recently retired, uh, or now emeritus dean from the IUPUI University Library. I'm currently working on a Mellon-funded project called Mapping the Digital Scholarly Infrastructure. Hey, my name is Ariana Becerril. I'm the executive director of Redamic, and I'm training uh, America, uh, open knowledge for Latin America and the global south. Well, here's the agenda for today's conversation. Uh, we would like to share the background and context that led to the emergence of this IOI initiative and let you know about what it is, its mission, vision, the leading working group, what we are doing now, and what are our plans for future work. So, thank you very much for this, uh, uh, for, for being here today with us. Thanks, please, Maurice. Well, I would like to begin by saying that uh, open access is gaining a momentum. The moves by different stakeholders like top level policymakers, funders, universities, libraries, and open access platforms are um, converging to create a moment where we can begin to join forces to create a shared open infrastructure for enabling 21st century scholarly communications. It is important to highlight, I believe, uh, that the current and prevailing science communication system has um, failed in terms of making science a global, participatory, and agreeable conversation. Uh, and even worse, it is becoming less and less sustainable. However, um, the open access landscape uh, we think it could be redone. Just in a few months, we have seen determined actions to achieve open access in different directions and um, with diverse strategies. For example, uh, the funders coordinated actions like Planes, an ambitious, you know, an ambitious plan to achieve open access by 2020, uh, but with high ways of keeping the control of science communication in hands of commercial corporations, to the flip from a pay to read to pay to policy strategy, which um, doesn't work for a participatory and sustainable open access ecosystem. Uh, many decisions towards uh, making knowledge open, like uh, different and severe contract cancellations, at least 10 negotiations and cancellations uh, in so far this year. The recent launch of GLOAL, the Global Alliance of Open Access Security Communication Platforms, an initiative uh, that is supported by UNESCO and that was launched at the end of last year. Uh, with a recognition of the principle that scientific and scholarly knowledge is a global public good, essential for the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Well, in this alliance, for example, different platforms agreed to join forces to democratize scientific knowledge, following a multicultural, multiculturalistic, and multilingual approach. Uh, the emergence, as well, the European Open Science Cloud, a cloud for research data in Europe. And America, just to say uh, another example, an initiative led by Redalica and Claxo that is taking advantage of the Latin American ecosystem, technology, knowledge, and experience of multiple organizations, platforms, and universities, so that scholarly communication remains important of the academy, and um, that avoids losing subsidies uh, by choosing a shift to address open access with commercial strategies. Well, next please, Luis. Yeah. Now let's move to the scholarly communication worldwide context. The situation, uh, I would say, of vulnerability of the efforts devoted to non profit open access is truly worrisome. We need to provide routes to sustainability that will prevent open infrastructure from being controlled by commercial enterprises in order to survive. Uh, is, these days, many projects and services have come and gone, others have survived. Um, commercial acquisitions of infrastructure are moved entirely consistent with uh, private interests and are a strategic, a strategic to buy both companies beyond content licensing to the things, analytics, workflow, and decision support companies. With an increasing control of uh, the knowledge production circuit and the rise of 
the situations in where you or how to deposit. Uh, so it remains challenging to initiate and sustain non-profit projects as well as to achieve competitiveness and innovation. But it is becoming clear that uh, the potential of the, um, of the scholarly open infrastructure as a viable alternative to proprietary and costly services and products developed by commercial providers. So, uh, but there is also the fact that several projects are working in isolation. And that um, may or may not work with each other, with inconsistent funding, and with the opportunity to be part of an open infrastructure that contributes in its sustainability. Uh, well, it is clear that the needs of today's diverse scholarly communities are not being met by the existing, largely uncoordinated scholarly infrastructure. And in some regions like Latin America, where we've got an actively open, non academia and science a communication system. We are witnessing the weakening of a regional scholarly infrastructure that has been built and sustained by, by hundreds of universities, academic institutions, and non-profit platforms, and that has been working for decades with the vision of science as a public community. But now it's being disrupted by commercial strategies like the adoption of ABC, for example. Uh, what is more, you know, regarding Latin America, and, I, and I'm talking about Latin America as an example because it is a way from where I stand. Uh, it is very sad to see how more and more national systems of journal assessment uh, disqualify local journals if they don't rank in the first uh, quartiles of the stops of web science, even the products, for example. No matter how much they have contributed to the history and problem solving of a discipline. Um, as a consequence, uh, uh, we have witnessed local journals that are now receiving fewer direct resources and they are receiving fewer contributions from authors because researchers are discouraged from publishing them. So, um, researchers are discouraged because local journals are not fulfill the requirements needed to be consumer mainstream uh, journals and researchers' salaries and incentives depend on the mainstream journals. Um, this has happened in Colombia, in Mexico, and in many other countries. The list of such examples is vast, not only in this region, but along the globe. So right now we are looking at an ecosystem at a risk of total collapse, and I believe this is terrible alarming. Uh, so it is of a remarkable importance to build an infrastructure to take advantage of the great benefits that communication and information technologies now provide to professionalize institutions so that, that they can create a publishing tradition and anything else that can further the task of taking back control of the scholarly communication, which is currently dominated by private interests. So we have to be more critical and creative and we have to question who are the players, uh, what are their motivations, whose interests are being served. What does the landscape look like now and what have we created? But uh, over those, which landscape do we want for our next generation scientific communication system? How much does it cost? How much should it cost? Uh, so we have a great opportunity to rethink the model in which the expenditure of economic resources in the dissemination of knowledge is seen as an investment that returns value to the academic community to the institutions that generate knowledge. Uh, next, please. What, what are the risks of doing nothing, for example? Well, the imbalance between academy owned and commercial infrastructure will cause the weakening of academy owned projects to the point perhaps will disappear, leading to the privatization of public knowledge. Uh, side of behavior led to loss of competitiveness. It is important also to optimize the use of resources to gain sustainability and credibility. And uh, of course, the risk is a loss of relevance, integrity, and trust in our institutions. So the call, next please. The, the call is for an open community control infrastructure to support open access to knowledge. We intend to create a new open infrastructure system that will enable us to work in a more integrated, collaborative, and strategic way. 
There are many examples of working efforts to point to and learn from. I, learned, I, I already mentioned some of them. Uh, we have an, an opportunity to rethink community investing strategies uh, to strengthen the scholarly and community-owned infrastructure. Uh, there is a narrow window to construct and support a comprehensive framework for collective action to impact the broader ecosystem at global scale, but firm and decisive actions are required. Uh, well, I, I think uh, in, it's all. Now I would like to invite Maurice to talk more about IOI's details. Please, Maurice, go ahead. Morris, you're on mute. There we go. How about unmute? <laughs> um, is that better? Okay, yeah. great. So to talk about uh, IOI in specific, um, and of course there's a long history of uh, nonprofit organizations, of institutions, communities, many people working on different aspects of uh, this incredibly complex and rich problem of how we build infrastructure um, for, uh, that, that can support open knowledge, that can support scholarship. Um, and IOI is a specific uh, coming together of many of those different organizations who have been working in this space for a long time. Uh, and this was really in April of 2018 that many of those organizations um, got involved uh, about these questions about providing uh, tools, services, um, a variety of uh, aspects of infrastructure that support community controlled um, scholarship. And the joint roadmap for open science tools was uh, the meeting where many of these uh, organizations came together. That's Jay Ross, and there's a link there. Um, I encourage you to take a look at that and learn a, bit, a little bit more about that. But the most important thing was that this umbrella that, that brought many people together to start organizing around uh, collective action in this space. So that initial effort of JROS was really about um, facilitating technical collaboration. How do we look at interoperability of the tools? Of course, we have a landscape that's really rich with tools, but they don't necessarily work together as well as we would hope. Um, and that was really the focus of that discussion. A subgroup emerged out of that uh, conversation that really said, well, there's another huge problem. We need to come up with a funding model that can provide the kind of support that these efforts need. Um, it's grassroots, it's community. There's a lot of good work going on and, and the sustainability and funding of that should really come front and center. Um, the result of that conversation was investment open. And that's really what we'll focus on talking about today is that group that came out and said, how, how might we approach this problem of building a funding model to support and sustain the infrastructure? Uh, so who we are, this is, a, uh, we'll have a couple of quick logo slides here, um, but it is this international group of organizations that try to take this question to a global scale. Uh, we know we have mutual goals. We know we've been working together uh, sort of parallel in this space for a long time. The question is, how could we come together? And so this is a slide of the members of the um, steering committee. Uh, and this uh, really is from many different parts of uh, the globe and only has opportunity for expanding and become in, uh, becoming more inclusive as we uh, continually bring in um, different uh, members, different areas, different regions of the globe. Um, and that was really has been part of the invitation uh, of, for letters of support. Uh, this uh, launching of this initiative uh, now is only you know, a week, couple of weeks old. Uh, and so uh, the letter that's been put out there for um, institutions and individuals to sign up to support uh, the direction, the idea, um, and, uh, and where we're going. And uh, well, I think we're, so we, there's um, uh, dozens of institutions now that are signing up for that larger effort. And this is really um, the steering committee that has been uh, guiding the effort itself. Uh, but really encourage you to go and, to investinopen.org. There's a place to sign for uh, both individuals and institutions to sign up and say, yes, this is a great idea. We're supportive and want to be involved in how the initiative grows. 
Um, sorry about that. Uh, so the strategy here is really about collective action uh, at scale. And the question will often come up and say, what's different now? Right? Many people have been working this problem. There have been many different uh, efforts of saying how might we collaborate, how might we bring things together. Um, and very reasonably, the question uh, that comes up over and over is, what's different now? So this really is a different model, and it's based in a different type of thinking. Um, the global consciousness in particular um, is, speaks to uh, both the urgency of now, what's needed, and to the different type of thinking that we can uh, bring uh, towards a very complex um, set of uh, variables and circumstances and um, that really supports scholarly infrastructure. So uh, structure around the network of communities and alliances, um, which is absolutely necessary for that global consciousness. How do we align towards interdependence? How do we recognize the ways that we are deeply interdependent and use that as a strength uh, to intentionally form a network? Uh, particularly alongside of that, enabling a coherence approach. So looking at um, the structural elements that we have, looking at this question of interoperability and integration, how does every part relate to the whole? What is? What are all the parts? Can we name them? Can we say what their role is and what they are most essential for and how they are going to work in coordination with each of the other pieces? And then enacting sustainable fiscal stewardship uh, alongside of those first two gestures. So reinvesting, being responsible with limited resources, we have um, not only the resources uh, that are currently going into this uh, ecosystem, but how do we bring a significant and meaningful stream of new resources that will help uh, both to grow the overall infrastructure, the overall ecosystem, but also to pool the risk to, and to manage our collective investment. Uh, risk is much better managed centrally and when we share it than when each of us have to carry a different piece. The desired future state for IOI, so a co coherent end-to-end -end open community controlled infrastructure is really what we're talking about. Bringing a balance between um, what is uh, belongs to the public knowledge uh, what is supported by public and open institutions and the value of public scholarship and culture. Um, the full life cycle of science and scholarship is really what we're talking about, not just the sharing, not just the producing of it, um, but end to end throughout its life cycle. Um, bringing sufficient funding support to support the full evolution, the maintenance and operation and support of this infrastructure, uh, too often right now, the support really goes uh, very understandably and very importantly towards innovation and towards new building uh, in the space. What is most needed is also to be able to bring balance towards the funding and sustainability of the ongoing evolution of the infrastructure that sits at the heart of all of these projects. Um, as well, as, so that's the third thing, is supporting the innovation as well as the ongoing maintenance. It's absolutely essential. And then bringing funding from a mix of sources. Um, we can't uh, afford to rely only uh, there, and there are many funding, funding players in the space, um, but can we uh, bring the proper diversity to the mix of funds, um, not just from institutions, not only from government agencies, private foundations, variety of type of funders that can all be active in the space. And IOI is really not trying to um, preclude or preempt any of the funding that's going in. It's really meant to ride alongside all of the good work that's going on and to provide a place that can distribute funding that can provide um, a, a, a meaningful addition to the space, not a, not a, a replacement. And it's probably the most important thing, one of the key ideas about IOI is it is um, standing alongside of existing efforts. It's providing a, a new uh, element uh, for sustainability and ongoing support of the infrastructure. Um, so let's talk about that for a moment. What are the two ideas of IOI? What are the two th key things? So one, primarily to assess and recommend, to look at the landscape of uh, scholarly infrastructure, really provide a framework for um, both assessment and discussion of looking at open infrastructure, looking at functionality, usage, um, health and financial needs. If we're really gonna talk about looking at the whole, 
Uh, again, going back to we have to know what each of the parts are. We have to know how they fit together. We need to know what they're bringing to the space. We need to know where our gaps are, what we don't know, what we need to look into further. And that's really what this, uh, the framework is, is providing an ongoing uh, forum for discussion about what the overall infrastructure looks like, um, where its gaps and weaknesses are and where it's healthy, and making recommendations based on an analysis of that landscape. The second function is then to coordinate funding. So if that uh, first function is uh, making recommendation, uh, providing greater confidence to investors, providing greater context uh, for knowledge of the um, different projects and how they fit together and, and how they can productively, uh, uh, how the investments can productively be directed, then to coordinate that funding is the, is the second function. Uh, following the recommendations of the framework, um, uh, coordinating financial resources, again, from all of the different players that may be providing uh, funding to projects or just into the space in general, and really increasing the impact of funding uh, as well as the amount of funding. As the confidence increases in our knowledge of our open infrastructure landscape, so does the ability to uh, direct the funding and to increase the overall funding. Um, again, for IOI, this is not about um, trying to be the only, uh, you know, displacing any uh, elements that are in the space already or uh, trying to be the, become the new center or the new place that all this happens, but really to join in uh, with existing efforts and to work alongside as a partner. So what's going on right now with IOI? Um, it's uh, the initiative itself, uh, you know, um, so the idea uh, coming out of JROS about a year ago, um, many of the efforts of, of the uh, sort of the steering committee and going through forming governance, uh, coming up with a funding structure, looking at staff, bringing on staffing and so forth, uh, all of that is happening right now. It's been going on for the last number of months. Um, and, and we'll talk about the immediate future of the next six months, but that's really what's happening right now is putting all of that structure in place to form uh, an impactful and effective um, initiative. Uh, there's research going on, and David's gonna take us through some of the uh, research that's going on right now in just a moment, uh, particularly the uh, census, so what does the landscape look like, um, and the library survey as well. It's really just trying to understand uh, the fundamentals of the landscape, uh, where are the gaps, where are the strengths, where, where uh, can we most productively direct collective action. And in the third uh, point, they're seeking input and forming connections. And that's what today is really uh, about part th that, that part as well, building relationships. Um, there are so many uh, great existing infrastructure initiatives and projects, so many uh, different really important perspectives um, in, uh, on the many things going on in this space that uh, this is really the key part is forming relationships. And uh, for all of those watching right now, for those who will watch the recording, um, that investinopen.org right now is acting as a center just for becoming aware of um, uh, all of the uh, folks that are interested and want to support the initiative um, and, to, and to join in um, with this next phase. So uh, David, with that, let me hand it over to you to talk a little bit about uh, the research. So the research project that um, is underway right now um, actually predates the Invest in Open Infrastructure um, project coming together. It's a Mellon funded project that uh, grew out of the two and a half percent commitment proposal that I made um, a couple of years ago. And uh, what we're attempting to do is to uh, get a good picture of what the scholarly infrastructure, um, communications infrastructure looks like um, to create this um, map of the end-to-end -end process and where there are uh, redundancies, where there are gaps, uh, just to get a lay of the land. Um, and so the first piece of that is a, a census of the of scholarly communication infrastructure. Um, we launched a survey, um, we launched the census in February um, and it's, it's ongoing, and I'll talk a little bit about our preliminary results in a minute. And the, the second piece of this is aimed at uh, trying to assess what the academic library investments in scholarly infrastructure are, 
um, again, to get a picture of who's putting in what kinds of dollars and um, to get a sense of where we might be able to leverage that, that income and hopefully to uh, get academic institutions to um, be more generous with their investments um, in this area. Um, and so that's the two pieces that we're working on right now. Next slide. Um, so the census, again, is uh, trying to get a, a picture of the, the various uh, infrastructure projects that are out there. Uh, we want to know what it looks like today. We want to get some idea about um, the state of these various organizations. Um, there have been a, a variety of uh, failures in this arena, most, most notably the Digital Preservation Network. Um, and so we want to get some sense of the uh, robustness and maturity of the various organizations that are trying to um, mount these projects, get a sense of what the risks are um, in terms of both uh, organizational structure, finances, um, technologies. Um, and so uh, we're trying to get a fairly rich view of a lot of organizations so we can begin to put this data together. And, and the hope is that we can provide ways uh, both to the institution, to the, the projects to um, enhance their, their ability to be productive. Um, and that as a result of this, we can uh, provide information to the various funders um, so that they can make uh, wise investments in the arena in the context of a, a bigger picture than most of the funders currently have. Next slide. So the basis for our uh, judgments on institutional uh, robustness and maturity come from uh, the structure that's been built by um, uh, Educopia that's in their community cultivation guide. And it looks at a variety of uh, aspects of organizational strength um, and looks at how mature the organization is. So we're using this, this uh, rubric to get a sense of the strength of various um, organizations in the uh, in the sector. Next slide. So we released this in February um, and ran it through almost the end of March. We got uh, 45 uh, full respondents, um, and I, I, I would say that was uh, somewhat disappointing. Although we well, we think there are. Um, two to four times as many organizations that are providing various kinds of infrastructure. Um, and um, we would encourage people who are associated with projects to uh, provide the information to the infrastructure. There is a link off of the Invest in Open Infrastructure webpage. Um, and so if you would put your data in, we would be appreciative of that. Um, but what we can see uh, initially is that um, the, the sense that many of us have that this is a bit of a hodgepodge um, in terms of organizational capacity. Um, some are longstanding, have all the aspects of a sound organization that you would want, um, and many of them uh, are just getting by on a, a shoestring and don't have the capacity um, to really put structures in place, um, annual reports, transparent um, funding, those kinds of things. So. Um, it's, we're getting a better sense of it, but um, right now the picture looks at uh, when we see the data as many of us suspected it, it really was. Next slide. So this, this chart is, uh, looks at um, the difference between, um, it's the variance between budgeted money and then the actual amount spent by um, a sample of six different providers um, we call them scholarly uh, communications resources, um, so we can have an obscure acronym. Um, but what you can see is that um, number six had some sort of event in their first year in 16 um, where they spent a whole lot more money than they had. And you can see that if, if ideally you'd want these numbers, this variance to be very small, and it's not. Um, so the, the financial uh, piece of the sector really is quite clearly um, not as stable as would be optimal. Next. 
And here are some examples of various organizational um, uh, indicators. So the first one is, is there a succession plan? Is there some way of migrating in uh, the event of institutional failure? And almost all of the institutions are in the, uh, no, they haven't gotten a chance to think about that column. Um, below that, you see annual reports. Um, many of them don't do it. Uh, it's probably about 50-50. Uh, some do their own, some are embedded in other organizations that do them. Um, you can see the different types of organization at the, at the top over here, uh, organizational structures. Um, and then legal status. Um, we uh, are looking at, uh, in our scan, uh, both not-for-profit open and uh, for-profit, um, which is what Mellon asked us to do. Um, so we all have a picture of that as well. Next slide. So we're just beginning a, a survey of libraries, uh, prim primarily focused in the United States to get a sense of their investment. Um, that survey will re be released in the next week or so. Um, so if you're a librarian, look out for that. Um, we'll be after you to uh, tell us what you're spending in various parts of the world, uh, in, on various parts of the infrastructure, um, both in terms of dollars and investment in people. Um, and this will give us some idea of, of at least this one sector that provides investment, whether we think we can leverage it uh, better or whether there are opportunities for more investment. Next slide. So that's the, the research. The uh, final thing for the, the formal presentation is what IOI um, is trying to accomplish in the next six months or so. Um, as Maurice has said, um, we're uh, at the very formative sta stages right now, we, we want to put together a governance model that um, can be as inclusive and global as, as we can manage it. Um, and um, key to that at this point is getting feedback from all of you. Um, how do we engage in a, and build an organization that's uh, broadly representative, but still able to um, take action effectively? Um, and especially how do we get uh, broad global uh, representation so that this is not simply a, a North American and European uh, initiative. We really need to be able to represent the, the needs of other parts of the world and the, the infrastructure that's been built there to meet those particular needs. Um, and uh, to do this, we need to begin to talk to funders about uh, how we're gonna build out this organization. We've, we've begun those conversations and are reasonably optimistic that we'll be successful um, so that um, in the not too distant future, we'll be able to um, hire staff to begin to formalize the processes um, and uh, begin to put this into, into uh, play. Next. So that's the, um, the, the end of the formal presentation. We have about 20 minutes um, for questions. We'd be happy to respond to that. Um, so please put those into the question and answer piece. Um, so there's a question about the library survey. Um, we will open that in a couple of weeks. I suspect it will stay open um, for at least a month, maybe into the early part of the summer. You'll hear from us. Questions, comments, thoughts? David, one just popped up in chat. So SCOS, um, Spark Europe is represented on the committee, uh, steering committee has been uh, from the beginning. Um, SCOS is a particular initiative aimed at bolstering what are considered to be very, very crucial um, pieces of the infrastructure. So I would imagine, I've, I've envisioned this personally as a, um, a broader initial, I mean, SCOS does a very deep dive into the vetting of organizations. Um, my guess is that we don't have the capacity to do the level of vetting that SCOS does, but we would want to do something like that across the whole sector. Uh, um, whether that gets integrated into what we're doing or whether SCOS um, aims to at particular pieces in the near term um, is up for, for grabs right now. I, I would expect we would begin to merge efforts as soon as we can. Um, 
but right now they're related, we're in touch with each other, um, but they are, are distinct at this time. And I'll be sure about them. So there is a question about uh, the more information on the governance. Um, we are in the process of thinking that through. If you have thoughts, um, there's a, a link on the, the IOI uh, page. You can send us your thoughts on that. Um, if you've got examples of best practice for trying to put this together, we would certainly welcome hearing that. There is a question um, on what do we mean by open infrastructure? Um, so there are, um, this is a bit fuzzy as, as you would anticipate. Um, I think the, certainly there are things that are uh, not for profit or community controlled with um, using open source that are clearly in bounds, whether or not um, commercial firms that make um, very firm commitments to open principles, um, whether or not they would be engaged, I think is still an open question um, that we haven't come down on. So there's some gray area. I think at this stage, um, we would not be interested in for-profit closed systems, but um, we would have some flexibility besides that. There's a question about Latin America. You wanna take that, Ariana? in the chat. I think I can see it. I saw the one related to regarding to uh, French speaking uh, initiatives, but I can see Latin American. Um, So Ariana, while you're looking at that, I'll just speak to um, uh, Dan Whaley also in the um, chat. I want to uh, offer some um, thoughts on what we mean by open infrastructure. Um, so it is a, a range of services, protocols, and standards, and this is for anyone not tracking on the chat, um, but uh, please do see Dan's response there since it's very good. But uh, it's a, a whole set of services, protocols, and standards. Uh, it's not just a, a single set of software. It's not, you know, it's necessarily pl a, a platform. It's not necessarily an application, um, but a, a wide range of all of the elements that mix together to create services and workflows um, that support the entire research uh, lifecycle. So it's talking from the phases of research through collaboration, experimentation, data collection and storage, data organization, uh, data analysis, computation, authorship, there, uh, all the way through to publishing and archiving uh, and citation. So there are many different uh, phases of, of scholarship and a wide variety of complex tools um, that support those. Some of those are built through open source uh, community efforts. Some of them are built more by a small group of people but are structured to integrate with the, that open ecosystem. Some are built by um, uh, you know, vendors and entities that are structured more as uh, for-profit uh, companies. And again, our uh, emphasis of this particular initiative is bringing the proper uh, uh, financial funding and uh, supporting infrastructure to those um, uh, open uh, infrastructure sets of services and protocols uh, and software um, that are particularly worked with uh, by community uh, efforts to support scholarship. Uh, on a global scale. Uh, it, it would be, it is worth pointing out in this context that um, the, uh, that scholarship is local to its context and, and to its community, to the research that's uh, produced um, by those communities. So what works in uh, South America is different from what will work in Southeast Asia, is different from Australia, from Europe, uh, Central America, the US and so forth. Uh, and the purpose of IOI in, in, from the startup phase is to acknowledge that um, foremost and upfront and to say the you know, communities and, and regions know the best about what works most appropriately for their context, for their culture, for the scholarship and research that's produced there. Um, and to integrate with those uh, the efforts of, the, of communities and to support uh, the building of infrastructure that really supports um, that work. Uh, and um, and works alongside of 
the um, uh, all of the good work that is happening right now. But yeah, in the um, Ariana, did you want to? Yeah, in the particular case of Latin America, uh, as I said at the beginning, but it, it maybe was hard to to to, to her. Uh, well, in the case of Latin America, we have uh, built an uh, a natively open and, um, and non for profit academy owned uh, open infrastructure. So the, the interest of Latin America to be of being part of an initiative like IOI is to um, first of all to start this uh, interaction with other models, as uh, Maurice said in order to uh, be more visible because uh, there are some regions like the Latin American region that is not visible to other parts of the world like the North. So it is, uh, it is really worthy to be part of a global initiative in terms of visibility, but, but also we are facing a, a very um, worrisome disruption of our open infrastructure and open e ecosystem in Latin America because of uh, all those uh, commercial products and services that are now uh, appropriating from uh, lots of publications that are that were open and that, that were uh, scholarly funded and now they are kind of appropriate appropriate uh, or are, are, yes, appropriated by uh, different commercial publishers so we are facing a disruption of this ecosystem and in this initiative is it's extremely important in, in terms of uh, bringing investment into the open infrastructure that in some parts of the world, like the Latin American, have demonstrated and have shown that it really works to be an alternative to commercial publishers. So, uh, but, but we are uh, at risk of disappearing or we are very vulnerable uh, if we continue as we are working in isolation and without a, a, an organization, a formal or informal, but we have to work together to, to guarantee sustainability and to be more competitive and more innovative in order to be a serious alternative to commercial publishers. So there's a question about cloud infrastructure. Um, I, I don't think that we have made any determinations about particular technologies. Um, and, and I think part of that would, would be, you know, in what context is that an effective uh, technology? So, so we haven't really come to any conclusions about that at this point. Um, there's a question about if everything goes according to plan, when would we hope to get um, funding uh, in place for various uh, infrastructure providers? Um, sooner rather than later, but I don't know that um, we would be in a position to um, we, we need to get some of the framework pieces done first, and that's probably um, a year's work uh, to start with. And then I think we would look at beginning to build uh, funder support, although we'll certainly begin conversations with funders immediately. Uh, there's a question about whether we would plan on prioritizing uh, a number of different kinds of infrastructures. I don't think we would have a position on a, on a number, but I think we would, um, the framework would want to say, um, here's an area that is well-developed with uh, sound organizations. They might need some ongoing funding, and here's an area where we believe that some innovation and investment, investment and innovation would be useful. Um, so I, I think that we would, uh, I don't know how specific we would be in terms of making recommendations, um, but I think we would have priorities, how specific they would be, I'm not sure. Uh, there was a reference in the chat uh, and some discussion of a, you know, a failed process and project. Uh, one re re was reference with the Digital Preservation Network or DPN, which is a North American um, effort to organize uh, low-level um, archiving and long-term preservation. A 20-year commitment to preservation was the central idea of, of Deepin. Um, and there's a link in the chat where you can re read more about uh, Deepin was um, disbanded uh, last fall. Um, but just wanted to make a point about failed processes and projects or things that don't work out uh, as the community might have hoped that they would, we might say. 
Um, we absolutely have to learn from what doesn't work. Um, the fact that some things don't work out doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. That's that would it's sort of the end of innovation. Uh, the the very process that we're going through is one of just try it and see if it works. And if it does, if it resonates, um, then we have found success. If it doesn't, we have you know successfully discovered something that we can learn from. That's the process of science. Um, in many different regions of the world, we'll find these examples over and over again. The projects that work out, the initiatives that succeed and the ones um, that don't work out as we would have hoped them to, or that maybe they fall apart, or maybe they uh, land in a place that wasn't what any of us expected. Um, we have to find a way to learn from those and to carry them forward. And that I would say is one aspect of the framework, is not only to analyze the successes and see the parts that work, um, but the ones that, that don't, and what can we learn them from them and carry forward. Um, when things don't succeed, the, probably the worst thing that we could do is walk away from them and not carry forward the lessons. Um, then the effort is perhaps wasted. Uh, if we can pull out the important things, even deepen, have very important things that we learned, it had very important things that produced, um, and we can find those examples, uh, I would uh, guarantee in every region of the world. And how do we, as we, form a picture of the overall network and its capacities and the things that it needs and the things that we need to learn, how do we put together um, that picture and turn it into a, a productive thing that we can all observe and understand? There's a question about um, saying a little bit more about how academic libraries would interact with IOI. Um, I think the one way I have looked at this would be that the framework that IOI uh, hopes to put in place would be um, kind of an Angie's list for people who want to make investments. So an academic library could look at that and say, uh, here's a, I mean, most academic libraries will make investments in the products that are very important to them and that they use heavily. But there are a lot of other things that they might want to consider and this would bring those to their attention. Um, there's a question about whether or not IOI would be the vehicle for those investments. Um, I think that IOI would be prepared to offer um, the option of that kind of a vehicle, to, but it would probably depend on the institution's ability to make uh, contributions in various ways. And that's, in my experience, very different across different parts of the world. So I think we'd want to figure out how to um, channel investments to various projects in ways that work um, both in the country where the investment's coming from and um, supports the organization based on the uh, rules that they have to follow given where they are in either in an institution or um, how the particular um, things work in their part of the world. So I think we'd want to create a variety of um, alternatives and make those alternatives clear and as easy as possible. So there's a question uh, asking us to restate for one more time the specific problem that we're trying to solve. Um, I think the way that I would look at this is to say um, we need to be able to make larger and wiser investments in open infrastructure and that the capacity to do that requires us to have a better picture of what that infrastructure is, um, who's providing it, who's providing it well, which of those organizations are sound and robust. And when investors can look at that whole picture, which is almost impossible for any of those investors to do right now, then our hope would be that they would be more confident in making investments, whether it's foundations or governments or institutions. Um, and that would lead to more and better investment in the sector, which would create the infrastructure um, that would work well and provide us all what we, we need to do to get this done. Uh, another way to um, look at how, how we understand the different components of the, the space and, what, and the problem that we're, uh, so solving a problem, um, I don't know that there is a problem to solve. It's an incredibly complex uh, landscape. We're talking about you know, human scholarship, public knowledge, we're talking about culture. Um, what we can do is we can expect to improve our position, to continually improve 
Um, if we're aiming to solve um, anything that would suggest an endpoint, that would suggest perhaps a moment that we could all reflect and say, great, we did our job, we're done. Um, and I, I uh, don't know that I would agree that we could reach that, but we can absolutely join together in collective action to improve our position. Um, within the uh, life cycle of research, there are many, many vendors who are active and, and who have, um, creating and selling products into the space. Um, one way to look at um, that, from, you know, uh, is is there are our vendors good or bad? Is open infrastructure good or bad? That's not um, the gesture that we want to create. It's that there should be a balance in the space. Um, the risk of uh, having uh, a scholarly research space that is completely dominated by for-profit entities and for-profit applications is that the question of who owns knowledge, who gets access to knowledge, who decides what, who can see what, who decides what gets preserved, those are put into the hands of private companies. Um, so it's not a question of doing away with vendors and private companies at all. They're extraordinarily important, but there does need to be a balance in the space. And if we're talking about public ownership of public knowledge for the public good, um, that the infrastructure that that rides on, uh, that we need to think very deeply about that. Um, you can create public knowledge that sits on um, uh, proprietary infrastructure. You can have proprietary knowledge that sits on open infrastructure. All of these things are possible. Um, but if there's not a balance in the space, the risk is that we move into a world in which all knowledge is closed, all knowledge sits on proprietary infrastructure, and very small groups of people are making decisions of, that govern the direction of science and the progress of knowledge. Um, and that's what we're really trying to bring is support for the balance in the space, for the open infrastructure and the community created projects um, that can effectively provide that kind of balance. Um, there's one last question I'm just trying to interpret. So uh, a plan for public communication, a question about plan for public communication among people who are interested in IOI, um, either a Google group um, or a chat room, some sorts of uh, fora like that. Um, absolutely keep an eye on um, uh, the invest in open.org as we uh, create the forums for a community input and for large scale discussion um, and chat um, as we get the initiative off the ground here, those should absolutely be at the forefront of our um, uh, thinking and how to create those kind of uh, sort of global um, fora where we can have the chat. So watch invest in open.org um, for that. Um, and the, we are right at time, so we might conclude. I'll perhaps include, uh, conclude with a uh, reminder that um, this is an all-volunteer effort. Uh, we are all here because we believe in this. Uh, we're here because we want to be inclusive. We want to um, have a gesture of openness, and we're moving as fast as we can in that and uh, and in combining our efforts. So. Um, uh, Every piece of uh, input, all of your, the thoughts, everything um, that all of you can add to the discussion uh, and in all of your networks and your spheres to join ideas together um, are absolutely welcome and deeply appreciated. Uh, we are all moving together and, and uh, in the spirit of um, uh, you know, joint action um, and we'll find our way, uh, the more that we can um, include all of the perspectives and input, um, it's deeply valuable. Um, so we're going to uh, go now. Uh, we invite you again to watch investinopen.org for, um, for further updates. Uh, please do sign up there to support the initiative. Uh, all of your support is deeply appreciated and um, watch this space. We will uh, see all of you soon and thank you very much for joining this morning.